Welcome back to another edition of Gen CFB. I'm Jessica Smetana. She's Lucy Rodine. Lucy's back from her trip to Oregon, and Taylor has been begging us to do winners or losers all season and talk about our winners and losers from the weekend. So we're going to do that, Lucy, and then we're going to talk about a couple big games coming up next week. And we're doing it all season with Cheese It. We are feeling the cheesiest this year with Cheese It. Lucy, you just got back from Oregon. Wow, what a, what, a, what a game. How are you feeling? I know you're buzzing. I know you loved Oregon. You give me like Oregon vibes. It just feels like a place. Is it because I'm white? I was going to say that you, you, well. Is it because I'm pale? <laughs> I'm just going to say. Do I look the, like I hike for fun? The vibes, the vibes matched your attitude, I would say, which I can't say about every college that you've been to this year. So tell us how your trip went. It was awesome. You're right. It did match like my energy and vibe. I will say they were some of the friendliest fans that we've interacted with throughout this entire series. Not that there have been particularly unfriendly fans, but the everyone was so nice there. Even the Ohio State fans, which is a little odd, but like the whole vibe of it was so great. I, I really think it's one of the more underrated venues in college football, even though I know it's you know talked about a lot, but their capacity for their stadium is pretty small. It's like I think it's around 50,000, but they oversold. So there were 60,000 people there, which was a stadium record, but it was deafening. It was so loud. And the way the stadium is built, there's like an overhang that traps the sound. It was just an awesome experience that truly reflected, one, just how great that program is right now and how amazing of a game that was where like Alabama Georgia was a lot of fun and you know we all really enjoyed that game but it was very much you know we had two completely different games going on where this one it just it was so back and forth and it just felt so constant that it was like you were hooked the second you were there it was such a great atmosphere and like I would say that if you're a Big Ten fan and you're thinking about taking a road trip to visit some of the new teams I would put Eugene top of that list. Yeah, seven lead changes in that game, which brings us to our first winner of week seven, Dan Lanning, the big winner. We're recording this on Tuesday where we are now being informed that Dan Lanning intentionally had 12 men on the field at the end of the game to burn some time off the clock. Lucy, is he now just saying this to make himself sound like he's this like Belichickian loophole genius and he, he knows all the rules loopholes or... Uh, Do you think like they actually they prep for this in practice so that if this situation happened, they'd be able to uh, end the game with Ohio State running out of time to throw a touchdown or kick a field goal? At first, I thought it wasn't intentional. And I I believe that Dan Landing hasn't come out and said that this was that he did this. He's just very much implied it. Like he's like, I'm not saying yes, but I'm not saying no. Right. Um, I think what changes my mind on it, thinking that he did do it intentionally, was the fact that it did come out of a timeout. And Oregon's a pretty well-disciplined team outside of the whole spitting incident. Yeah, so that like, wasn't great. It, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> um, where I, I just have a hard time believing that that late in the game you would make sort of just such a, you know, mistake like that just something just so like buffoonish so I think he did do it on purpose and like you kind of saw throughout the game and throughout his entire career at Oregon Dan Lanning coaches like everything is on fire but in like a very (laughs) like in a firefighter way not like oh everything's on fire I don't know what's going on but like he's navigating this giant flame that is Oregon Ohio State so like he has always coached in such a risky risky fashion and has been willing to take a bunch of risks sometimes to the point where I'm like I want you to slow down a little bit this is making me anxious but like I think it was intentional and like hell yeah brother good for you yeah I mean intentional or not you're right he didn't like outwardly say like yes because uh I don't think he can I think that that would be a bad look they'll Um, change the rule because of that right well they might change it anyways but (laughs) um but either way it was a really awesome game I thought both teams played really really well both offenses looked great I feel for Will Howard on that last play I know he's getting crushed for it but he wasn't in a great spot they were out of field goal range and he just lost track of the clock we've seen it happen to quarterbacks a number of times before and it's a it's a bummer to lose the game that way if you're Ohio State but someone had to lose that game Um, and unfortunately it was them but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a rematch of this game later on the season Lucy Ryan Day is not beating the can't win a big game allegations after this weekend but do you think he'll get a chance for redemption later this year? 
I'd just love to know what Lou Holtz has to say about that. <laughs> like, really, that's what I would love to know in this situation. Yeah, he will. Um, Ohio State doesn't have, like, a particularly crazy difficult schedule. I think he's gotten kind of lucky that the Kurt Signetti hire at Indiana has played out so well because that's going to give Ohio State the chance for another ranked win. They've got Penn State in three weeks ago, and this isn't sort of, you know, it's not the Penn State team of years prior where they have a little bit of offense cooking for them and they seem to have things a little bit more together than they previously had. So I think that's going to be a more difficult matchup. It's at Happy Valley. So, like, they still have the chance to get a big win. I think that if we get to the situation where they struggle against this Michigan team, then, yeah, Ryan Day is in a really bad spot. I don't think that will happen. Most likely this season is going to end in a way that I bet we see Penn or Ohio State and Oregon in the Big Ten championship game again. And that would kick ass. I would love to watch that game again. Yeah, that would be great. Um, Evan Stewart and Tess Johnson had huge games. Dylan Gabriel had a monster game. We'll talk more about him in a little bit. Um, but we need to talk about our, our next winner from the weekend, which was... Texas, but by extension, Cooper Manning's hat, because, wow, did he look incredible in his ginormous cowboy hat on the sidelines. Lucy, Texas kind of did what we thought they would do in this game. They scored a lot of points, and Oklahoma could not score really any. The, the final was 34-3. to um, So this Red River rivalry sort of goes the way it did two years ago, not the way it went last year. And Texas gets their win uh, in Dallas and gets to move on to their big game this weekend against Georgia. Was there anything that stood out to you from Quinn Ewer's return uh, to Texas starting this game this weekend? Um, things were a little weird in the first half. Red River always has weird energy. It just tended to work a little bit more in Texas's favor this time around. Um, to score that many points against a very, very good Oklahoma defense. Uh, Oklahoma is the new Iowa. I feel pretty confident saying that where their offense is like a level of anemic that's really disturbing and their defense is so, so good. Um, so Texas, yeah, I mean, this is crazy. We're rolling into the Georgia week. They look phenomenal right now. Like, uh, no complaints for, for the Longhorns, but this is their their big test this weekend. Yeah, Texas's defense looked great. They sacked Michael Hawkins five times. They had 13 tackles for loss. And Oklahoma's offense, like you said, uh, third percentile in yards per play, EPA per rush, and fifth percentile in EPA per play. You're probably not going to win a game if you can't have uh, any plays with positive a positive EPA at all in your whole game. So really rough. Um, but that was a that was an exciting one, and I think you know good win for Texas. They tried to plant the flag at half field. I don't really I don't really understand how that works. Like it doesn't stay right. Like it it falls out every time. Yeah, it's. But, the hat was great. Yeah, I wish it was. I wish it was styrofoam, or like the <laughs> yeah, like right. if he had gone with like the like the Mike if you're Ryan gonna do hat. it obnoxiously. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're gonna do obnoxiously large, then you might as well just like make it catchy. Yeah, Lucy, who's our next big winner from this weekend? Our next big winner is Kirby Smart. It's a perfect transition since Texas and Georgia are playing this weekend. I'm I'm not gonna say the notes say got away with assault. <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> I'm not I'm not I'm not saying he did that. I'm reading what someone quote got away with assault end quote. Um, so obviously that's in reference to during the game, uh, it, a Mississippi state state player ended up on the Georgia sideline after a play, like seemed pretty harmless. And Kirby Smart in an incredibly rage filled moment, like push the shit out of this player, like like chess past them, sort of. <laughs> yes, uh, that was Mississippi State's quarterback. Um, yes. He, uh, Michael Van Buren, Kirby has since apologized for this, but a, a lot of people were making a very big deal out of it. I don't think it's I, a big deal. I think he should just pay a fine to exactly. that player. I think he should give that player a check for like 10 grand and then we call it a day you should say you can transfer to Georgia we'll let you come to Georgia <laughs> uh yeah it, it clearly he wasn't like I'm gonna beat the shit out of this college kid like that wasn't the intention here who did he think just, he was pushing like you thought it like, was a staff I, someone on a staff I just genuinely think he was so rage filled which by the way Georgia won this game by 10 points and Mississippi State is a dog shit team they were very very bad like this should have been a shutout there should never be a situation where Mississippi State scores any points against Georgia uh because that's how bad Mississippi State is and so to give up that many points uh to struggle against that team I can understand why he was so angry uh, um, so I just assumed that he just was 
seeing all red. He did not have any sort of color. Like, he was colorblind in the moment and couldn't see that that was a Mississippi State player. And he was just in this fury and fit of rage. And I don't think he realized what he was doing. But I just want to make it clear, my official stance is you should not shove players. Yeah, Kirby needs to be better you shouldn't do in it. that situation. Um, staying on the SEC, another big winner from the weekend, Death Valley. Lucy, everyone talks about night games at Death Valley and with reason because LSU did not lead for a single second of this game, but they came back and they won it and it was absolutely spectacular in overtime. And I want to give Death Valley some of the credit. Like what percentage credit do we give Death Valley itself for this win? I feel like you should give Death Valley a ton of credit. I'd go full 50%. 50, because, okay. Yeah, I'm going high on that one because, like you said, LSU did not lead that entire game. Um, LSU's quarterback did not play well, extremely inaccurate. Only con- like the big moment was that fourth and five conversion. That's a Death Valley moment. So I want to give Death Valley all the credit in the world. So we were at Eugene, as we kind of previously mentioned, the Ohio State Oregon game and LSU. Ole Miss started about the same time. Uh, we had already left the field from storming. This game was so uploaded long. all our footage, so and we long. had overtime had not started yet. <laughs> well, because there were like combined like fifty incomplete passes, I yeah. think, in this game. Um, like you mentioned, and I don't know. Did Ole Miss allegedly take any injuries? I don't know. I don't they know. actually, I don't, I don't think they did. They were kind of put on oh, notice for, for this game. That was a big talking point going into the week. Um, if it happened, Alleged. maybe maybe it was one time, but I, I didn't really see that become an issue. But um, you mentioned the fourth and five. Uh, this was the last drive for LSU in regulation where they needed to score a touchdown and it was a 13 play 75 yard drive it was like it would be like incompletion incompletion and then a 14 yard pass on fourth and six and then like incompletion incompletion two yard gain 19 yard pass on third down like it was just crazy and then the, they finished it with a 23 yard touchdown pass on fourth and five to Aaron Anderson and then in, in overtime just one pass boom over just an absolutely ridiculous game like you said Nussmeyer like I don't think he had like a a bad game he had a lot of incompletions but um he threw some outstanding passes when it mattered and that was sort of it like that was that was the game and LSU won Ole Miss put it like a lot into this team and they've already have two losses in the SEC uh, my sneaky favorite moment from this game, and it's going to kind of hint at one of the losers, which is not nice to call him a loser, but my favorite moment from this game was after the game and Jackson Dart giving a press conference looking like he's about to join the dark side, like he was going to join the Sith in Star Wars, like he was full <laughs> Anakin, where he's like talking like this. He's like, I don't know how we lost this game. And he looked full movie character. Mm, Taylor, was great. Taylor, give me those numbers uh, for how long the quarters were in the LSU Ole Miss yep. game. First quarter, 33 minutes. Second quarter, 71 minutes. <laughs> Third quarter, 45 minutes. And then the fourth quarter was 62 minutes. And then you had an That's eight minute crazy. overtime. <laughs> That's amazing. It was that so is long. <laughs> insane. Uh, but you know what? Insane. I love it. I was here for it. Um, okay, Lucy, another big winner. Uh, fans of onside kicks. You saw a crazy onside kick. Describe it to us. Oh, that onside kick, like, I, for lack of a better term, kicked ass. So <laughs> Oregon decided to go with the onside kick. I believe it was second quarter, um, where it wasn't just a classic onside kick. They were like, we're going to nail this guy right in the chest. <laughs> like, du- like straight aim target practice and the Ohio State player was so caught off guard because he just he didn't assume that football was going right for him which like no one would have Oregon was able to recover they only got a field goal off of that possession but they stole the possession from Ohio State ended up coming down to obviously it was a one-point game but just it was such a ballsy move and quite aggressive quite aggressive both lit both in the football sense and also like he got hit hard yeah, everyone's always had that thought, like, why don't they just drill it as as hard as they can at someone and see what happens? And they, that was the strategy, and it they worked. Did it. The onside kick in the South Carolina-Alabama game was also quite a doozy. That was, wow, another great game, Lucy, which we probably don't have time to break down all of, but Alabama struggling at home against South Carolina after losing to Vanderbilt, mm, not a great two-week stretch for that defense. 
No, their defense is bad. I read some stat that they've given up more big plays this year than they have like the last three years combined. They just don't look good. Uh, and South Carolina probably should have won this game. Like there was, they were able to drive down the field so easily at the end of the game. And, and it ended up coming down to Alabama scoring a touchdown on just like a complete blown coverage. Um, had South Carolina just like defended that one play they would have won because the way they were so easily able to to drive down the field at the end of that game uh they looked a lot better than they did last week not alabama south carolina of course alabama just looks bad across the board and they're going to tennessee this weekend who also hasn't looked that good things are odd things are odd in tuscaloosa and i'm sure that all the fans are going to handle it very rationally i'm sure I'm yeah sure. i mean it yeah, the Alabama defense has not handled uh, the last two offenses. They've played well, but uh, the, maybe the bright side is that Tennessee's offense is completely different, and maybe they'll be better able to defend like the more uh, like drop back and pass like play action style offense versus like Sellers and Pavia, who are just gonna run when they can and blow up plays and, and like do well outside of the pocket. So I don't know, maybe that is something that you can hope for as an Alabama fan. But yeah, two weeks in a row, they have not looked their best. Lucy, of, our, of the winners left on our sheet, what do you want to talk about? Um, I think we have to talk Ashton Genty mm. because the numbers he is putting up are just like batshit crazy. And I think we're all doing a good job about talking about him. I just feel like it still should be more. <laughs> I feel like it, he should be, we probably should have led with him. I know we went to Oregon, Ohio State, but we should have led with him. He is now the Heisman favorite, which I believe the Heisman favorite has changed almost every single week of this season. You can check that out with our friends on DraftKings. But he's averaging almost 10 yards a carry. He has over 1,200 rushing yards on the season, 17 touchdowns through six games. Uh, I don't know if it's still up, but the Sickos committee has done a wonderful job of putting together a graphic of teams that have less rushing yards or touchdowns than Ashton Genty because he's so insanely good. Yeah, he's been having an incredible season and rightfully should be the favorite to win the Heisman at this point in the season. But I'm going to give our preemptive like it's early, but preemptive October October Heisman to someone else, and that's Diego Pavia. He I think is an October Heisman contender, if not winner. Two weeks into it, maybe Kentucky this week. Vanderbilt on the brink of going bowling. Lucy, this has been a wild ride. Crazy, and I think hey. they they're favored against Ball State this weekend. So hopefully they hopefully they win that one. It would be a very Vanderbilt moment to like back to back <laughs> SEC wins, including Alabama and then lose to Ball State. But I don't think they'll do that. This is a very fun, interesting Vanderbilt team. I don't want to jump too far ahead because Texas is coming to town in two weeks. Mm. But what if I mean, what if they beat two number ones in the same month? I mean, then you have to just give them the national championship. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Actually, we should make that a rule. You have to give it to them on the spot. All right, we'll, let's talk about our losers really Which quick. Which that would mean Purdue should be national championship by now. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, I don't want to dwell on our on our losers because it makes me sad, but on our list, sixth and seventh year quarterbacks, not named Dylan Gabriel, are losers this week. We had some tough injury news about Cam Rising. I, I really do feel terrible for him. It has just not worked out. He has not been able to stay healthy. Graham Mertz tore his ACL and is out for the season for Florida. Um, Dylan Gabriel is like the sole guy who is just having an outstanding season in college football. Am I missing someone? I almost called you Lucy. I know that I'm Lucy and you're Jessica. Or is it Jennifer? I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, we're Jennifer, I think. We're both Jennifer. It's, look... I've been in several different time zones over the last like 48 hours. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to a player who I am always constantly rooting for. Uh, Spencer Petras, six-year quarterback, over 400 yards this weekend for Utah State. Wow. I am happy for him. I am rooting for him. Hell yeah, brother. Okay, so we'll add Spencer, Spencer Petras to our list of quarterbacks. I mean, Tyler Shuck's doing okay. Yeah. Um, Kate McNamara, Lucy, any? Who? Okay. Um, another big loser, the Calgorithm. Man. Uh, Cal, we were we were so we were doing so well. We were on such a high together and now two losses in a row in the ACC, both in games like really they should have won. They were just right there. They lost to Pitt this weekend, Lucy, at Pitt. Um, just a a really sad fall from from the highs of the pre game day Miami crowd. 
I want to give an, another winner shout out briefly. Pat Narduzzi seeing his team not score points again. He's feeling great right now. <laughs> and that is 100% true. You know, he was so excited to get into the press conference and be like, that's how you win a football game. Defense, Defense baby. Defense battle. <laughs> this is what I've been saying all this time, and you tried to doubt me. Um, okay, well, do you want to talk about any other losers, or should we move on to what's coming ahead in Week 8? I think we can move on. I okay. think it was overall a winner weekend. I think everyone had a lot of fun watching college football. The only other loser I put on the list were people who hate field storming. It was fun. I don't care what you say. Okay, I think that field storming in every scenario it's been deployed this year has been completely defensible. I saw people yeah. people were mad at Colorado fans for storming the field after a Hal Mary we're in a in a comeback win. Like if you can't storm the field then then win. And my argument is always like, this is a college football game. It's for the college kids. Let them storm the field. Right. Safely. Right. Just I chill out. Mention. Safely. Safely. Yeah. Safely. I think it's a little different for basketball just because you don't have as much time to get off the court or whatever. But that's yeah, not the point. And I do, I do worry about Gen players. CBB. <laughs> Gen CBB. <laughs> so actually, we should pitch that. Um, that yeah. I, I do worry about player safety. I hate when you see the clips of players like getting in fights with fans and fans like giving them the finger. Don't do that. That's stupid. Don't do that. Everyone be respectful, but have fun. That's what the sport's all about. Lucy, we have two... Very important game. I'm, every game this weekend is important, but two ranked versus ranked matchups that I think will have some serious playoff implications. Which game do you want to start with? I think I'd like to start with the game we're going to, which is Alabama at Tennessee. Uh, this game had a lot more hype two weeks ago. Hypo. Obviously, things a lot. There we go. A lot more hypo. Things have obviously changed quite a bit. Uh, Tennessee, Florida, I know we really didn't talk about it much. That's never a game I put any sort of stake into. That game has never been played normally once in history ever. <laughs> like, it just doesn't go right. Uh, that is a team where, like, every, no matter how good Tennessee is, no matter how bad Florida is, Florida always finds a way to compete in that game. So, like, I'm not putting too much stake into that. Um, although it could have been kind of a, not a season saver, but something great for Billy Napier. But I'm not counting Florida, Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, I'm definitely looking at. These are two teams that, like, their sort of weaknesses, as you highlighted earlier, or Tennessee, they don't have the offensive power they once did. They don't really have the Jalen Hyatt type of guy who can really take over. Uh, and Nico is still young, and you can see that. So they're having to rely on the run game a lot more than they're used to. And then Alabama's defense is just lost right now. Like, since halftime of that Georgia game, they have been pretty bad across the board. So, Somebody is going to have to figure it out. And that's why I'm excited for this game. Yeah, Tennessee doesn't really have that offensive like wide receiver weapon that you would hope to see. But they do have Dylan Sampson, who's been really outstanding for them playing running back. I think the big key for Alabama on offense, because Tennessee's defense is good, I, I still think they deserve a lot of credit. Um, Milrow can't turn it over. Like, don't turn the ball over. I, I still think Milrow is great. He won our September Heisman unanimously, Lucy. And I think he's due for a big game. But he can't turn it over, and he needs to just throw the ball to Ryan Williams. 20 times. Uh, we are getting nutty this season with Hampton Farms Peanuts, the official snack nut of tailgates, and they're going to be here with us all season as we Let's preview go. the next week's games. And that brings us to the big night game, 730 on ABC, number five, Georgia in Austin at number one, Texas. Texas is back, number one in the AP poll. Lucy, this is going to be a doozy. I am vacillating between Georgia wins by one point and Texas wins by like 12. I don't know who to pick in this game, but I'm really excited for it. These are two really good college football quarterbacks, Quinn Ewers and Carson Beck, uh, two teams that have great defenses, although Georgia has let some teams linger this year and they have given up a lot of points in the last few weeks. So who are you picking to win this huge game? Does Texas come out of the weekend undefeated still? I think Texas does. But this is a game that like, I'm going to say on Gen CFB that I think Texas wins, but you can bet everything i'm not going to put any money on it because i don't actually know what's going to happen texas has been playing so well all year and like they've handled all their opponents i believe o oklahoma scoring that field goal to start the game was the first time texas has trailed all season like they have just been electric this year and they have dominated where georgia has been playing with their food for a few weeks now i kind of think that works in georgia's favor a little bit because like kirby smart's out here assaulting players like that's got to get you know the vibes are going but i just think that right now Texas is I think Oregon is better than Texas I put Oregon as the best team in the country but right now Ooh. Texas is 
add that win. If Texas wins this game, you can convince they are the number one team, and I'll take that easily. But though, just Oregon winning against Ohio State like that, that is such a good win, and I really think that they're the best team in the country when Dylan Gabriel plays the way he does. Um, but this is the chance for Texas to sort of prove that. I just think that Texas is more well-rounded. I think they've kind of got it figured out. It's a home game. Uh, but wouldn't it be batshit crazy for Georgia to have two losses before oh my the gosh. end of October? It would be wild. I Now think... I'm talking myself into Georgia. I don't think they'll do that. <laughs> I think Texas is the slightly better team in this matchup. I think they put a lot of pressure on Beck. He's not been great outside of the pocket or under pressure, so that's going to be a huge key for them. Um, of the following games, Lucy, are you willing to pick any upsets? Oklahoma State at BYU, Miami at Louisville, Nebraska at Indiana, Auburn at Missouri, Michigan at Illinois. (laughs) Uh, You guys need to see the faces Lucy's making right now. LSU at Arkansas, Kansas State at West Virginia. These are all games that have big conference implications. Uh, I think there's there's no way that all the favorites win. Let's put it like mathematically, it's not happening. So who are we picking for a big upset this weekend? I could see Illinois winning. I know that they were, I don't know what happened with Purdue. The One of the weirder games that was of crazy. the season. Uh, I could see Illinois winning. Michigan really just doesn't have it figured out right now. Although, I mean, Illinois is ranked higher than Michigan, which is just wild to say. And it's in Champaign. Uh, I could see LSU losing to Arkansas coming off a big win. I know that Arkansas is also coming off a big win, but I believe they're coming off a bye. Uh, yeah, I, there's a lot of upsets that are happening. And Jess, do you have any picks? Um, I'm going to pick the the opposite of an upset. I think Miami is going to win this game at Louisville by two touchdowns. I thought you were going to say they were going to lose. No, That's I why think, I tossed it to you. I think Miami is going to win after all of the shit that people have been talking about them after those not near us. losses to Cal and Virginia Tech. No, not us. We've barely not talked us. about Miami this season, so I don't think we can be accused of saying anything mean about them, except for all bias aside when I said that their schedule was really easy. Um, Lucy, it's going to be a fun weekend. Enjoy Tennessee, and I'm excited for you to come back and tell us that it was your favorite place you've ever been. I don't think it will be. Oregon really was great, and a lot of people have been very rude to me this week of being like, wow, you say every place is the best place you've ever been. Sorry for getting new information and changing my opinion. Maybe we could all take a lesson from me there. Yeah, and just to, all bias aside, just to reinforce it, Louisville does not have a chance this weekend. We'll see you guys next week.